Welcome back, everyone. It was my pleasure to meet our final speaker tonight, Alice Gretchen, a couple of years ago when she heard about my Divorcing Religion workshop. I found Alice to be authentic and engaging right from the start. Alice Gretchen is an actress, author, and the founder of Dare to Doubt, a fantastic resource site for people detaching from harmful belief systems. I found her uh, website incredibly helpful, and I direct a lot of my clients there as well. That's Dare to Doubt. Alice has recently published her book, Wayward, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity, which you can learn more about in our exhibit hall. Tonight, Alice will be talking to us about her research on the neuroscience of mystical experiences. So I am very excited to hear what she has to say. Welcome, Alice Gretchen. Oh, thank you so much, Janice. And thank you again for putting this conference together. It really is an honor to be here. Um, so like Dr. Renau, I've written out my talk because there's a lot of data that I'm going to share and I want to make sure that I get it right. But first, I'm going to open up my presentation by playing you guys a little glimpse of my childhood. And let's see if I can figure out how to do the screen sharing thing into a keynote. It began January 20th, 1994. He couldn't walk straight. People don't know what to do. Some called it unusual. Just get so full that they're just bad. I carried her Others called it interesting. Their lives are totally transparent. Live through. It was unprecedented. And because of it, hundreds of thousands of people drew to a city, a church, to experience the Toronto blessing. I want to read from, from Luke chapter 1. So what you guys just saw, I grew up calling being slain by the spirit. We also called it getting drunk in the spirit. And I'm going to use these terms interchangeably, getting slain and getting drunk. So when I was eight, my parents were swept into this very revival movement, which was called the Toronto Blessing. And this movement, like other such revivals, had its roots in Pentecostal Christianity. And Pentecostalism, in short, emphasizes foregoing traditional doctrine in favor of being led by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit sometimes leads people to do some pretty bizarre looking stuff like what you just saw. This, I was told, was what it looked like to be touched by God. This is what God did to you when he wanted to show you his love. And I desperately wanted to be loved by God. But God never touched me at any of the revival meetings that my family went to. And so I learned to fake it. Whenever grown-ups put their hands on my head in prayer, I made a big show of pretending to be slain by the spirit. And I mimicked all of those symptoms that you saw in that video. I shook and I trembled and I fell to the floor just like I was supposed to. And I was terrified that I might go to hell for faking it because Jesus said that the one sin that couldn't be forgiven was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I didn't know how faking the Holy Spirit symptoms was anything less than blasphemy. But I was also afraid that if I didn't fake it, everyone would know that there was something wrong with me because there must be something wrong with me, something deeply sinful that kept the spirit at bay. All I wanted was to feel God's love, but he left me out at every revival conference that I ever went to. When I was 21, I found myself an atheist. I didn't want to be, 
But after a series of heartbreaking betrayals, I finally admitted that I was unwilling to spend the rest of my life pretending to believe in God when he had never actually been real to me. And then after about two months of enjoying all sorts of hedonistic newfound freedoms, I started having panic attacks. And my panic attacks were accompanied by crippling bouts of paranoia, auditory hallucinations, and a nameless fear that kept me up all night for nights on end. And the only thing that seemed to help when I was mid panic attack was self-harm. I would bang my head against the concrete walls of my apartment and I slapped my face as hard as I could repeatedly and I chewed my hands until they bled raw. I thought I was going crazy. I now know that what I was going through were symptoms of religious trauma syndrome. But at the time, I didn't understand what was happening to me. So I was in therapy for three years after that point, and my therapist was able to help me, and my panic attacks and self-harm eventually stopped. But although I gained confidence in myself and in my atheistic worldview, I still sometimes felt haunted by certain aspects of my former faith. And specifically, I felt haunted by the manifestations that I had once called being slain by the Spirit. If it wasn't God or the Holy Spirit, making all the people do those things that I showed you in that video, then what was? I didn't think everyone had faked it. I thought that something real had to have been happening for at least some people for the movement that was the Toronto Blessing to have gained such a following. I didn't like giving it much thought, but movies and TV shows about supernatural things like demonic possession uh, many of which I had to audition for as an actress. Um, these, this type of material felt very triggering to me, and it sent me right back into a hyper-anxious state. And I didn't want to admit it, but sometimes I was still scared that the Christians were right, that God was indeed real, and that I had forsaken him, and that I was now going to hell. I was 27 when I learned of religious trauma syndrome. Or RTS. I read Dr. Marlene Winnell's book, Leaving the Fold, which I can't recommend enough. And I learned that RTS is best compared to a combination of PTSD and complex PTSD. And suddenly all of the mental health symptoms that I'd been battling throughout my 20s made sense from my panic attacks to my spiritual triggers. Learning about religious trauma helped me understand that just because my mind no longer believed in hell, it didn't mean that my fear of it simply left my nervous system. My nervous system was convinced that I was doomed. My body and my psyche had been terrorized, programmed to believe that I was a goner, a lost soul for Satan to torture forever. And it didn't matter what my intellect had to say, my body was more powerful. But there was hope. In Leaving the Fold, Dr. Winnell writes of a healing phase that she calls rebuilding, when perceptions and beliefs are reconstructed. And I used this rebuilding phase as a guide to help me heal myself from the lingering effects of religious trauma. And I knew right away the first place that I needed to start. The perceptions and beliefs I most needed to reconstruct were the lingering doubts I had about the supernatural looking phenomena that I grew up calling the Holy Spirit. I needed to know what the manifestations of the spirit were, if not what people claimed them to be. So I dove into months and months of research, and I discovered a treasure trove of growing data that I'm very excited to share with you tonight. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not a neuroscientist or a psychologist, but I am a lay person who has lived through religious trauma and found healing. And understanding the phenomena that I was told was the touch of God was a really big part of that healing. And I hope you'll find it helpful too. So I've broken it down into three parts. We have what, how, and why. What was going on? How was it being done? And why were humans capable of these weird altered states? And also why weren't others like me? So part one. What was going on? 
Well, my research showed me that it was not really the Holy Spirit. Surprise. Furthermore, I learned that what I called getting slain by the Spirit or getting drunk on the Spirit was not unique to Christianity and in fact was found in spiritual groups all over the world. The Kung and San people of Southern Africa, they call it Lum and describe it as a healing state that they get to through dance and chanting. In the Indonesian-based movement called Subud, their spiritual practice is called Letihan Kajuan, a trance state that they believe connects them to the divine. Chinese martial artists call it Qigong deviation syndrome, when energy gets stuck in the body or goes awry. And the Quakers and Shakers of England and America call it ecstatic worship. But perhaps no other practice I've personally come across so closely compares to getting drunk on the spirit than what Hindu yogis call kundalini rising or serpent awakening, which they believe is an energy release that leads to an expanded state of consciousness. So I put together another little video, it's just about over a minute long, showing the similarities between these altered states. all have in common are many of the same symptoms. We have bodily shaking, rhythmic rocking, we have quivering limbs and convulsions, we have writhing on the floor, moaning, groaning, crying or laughing uncontrollably, and the spiritual leader sometimes laying hands on the recipient, often through touching the head or what some call the third eye. So what is this? <laughs> What's going on, I learned, is that all of the people you just saw were undergoing a soberly induced mystical experience. In short, a mystical experience is a temporary altered state of consciousness, one that usually feels full of profound meaning. In 1902, philosopher and psychologist William James said that mystical experiences could be defined by four qualities. One, ineffability meaning they can't really be described with words. They're like the ultimate be there moment. Two, noetic quality, which means relating to the mind or the intellect. So in other words, mystical experiences occur in one's own subjective inner world. Three, transiency, as in mystical experiences are transient. They're temporary, even if their effects or apparent revelations last a while longer. And four, passivity. According to William James, mystical experiences are something that happen to you, not, not something that you can necessarily just produce at will. And notice I said that the altered states you just saw in that video are soberly induced mystical experiences. And this is because mystical experiences can also be induced by non-sober means by ingesting psilocybin mushrooms, for example, or drinking the shamanic tea known as ayahuasca. I'm gonna focus on soberly induced mystical experiences, particularly those induced by spiritual and religious means, but I'll touch on the other ones later. So my research showed me that mystical experiences, like what I called getting drunk on the spirit, are indeed real for some. 
Others like myself may never be able to have them, and I'll explore why later. For now, let's look closer at people who are capable of having a soberly induced mystical experience. What is going on in their brains? This question led me to the field of neurotheology. And neurotheology, in short, is the science of what we call spirituality. And this field is so vast and so fascinating that it will likely take, take up my curiosity for a lifetime. So one of the leading neurotheologists that we have today is Dr. Andrew Newberg. Dr. Newberg has been studying the effect of belief on the human brain for decades. And one of the things he's found is that different religious practices have different effects on our bodies. For example, using SPECT imaging, Dr. Newberg found that the brains of meditating Buddhist monks showed increased activity in the frontal lobe, which is involved in concentration, and decreased activity in the parietal lobe, back here, which is our orientation area where we get our sense of space and time. And I'm going to show you a picture of what the monk's brains looked like during meditation. You'll notice there's a lot of red. Now, you might be thinking that it's all good and interesting to see what's going on in the brain during meditation, which we usually think of as a very calm, focused state of being, not like what we saw in the video. <laughs> But what about the mystical experiences, like I showed you in the video? Arguably, those more emotive mystical experiences are still forms of meditation, forms of deep prayer and transcendence. But unfortunately, there are limited amounts of data capturing these more spontaneous mystical experiences, like getting drunk on the spirit or having a kundalini awakening. Scientists and volunteers alike describe how these experiences are less conducive to a medically controlled environment. Prayer or meditation might be relatively easy to capture when someone's holding still. A person being slain by the spirit might be rolling around on the floor and unable to wear the wire attachments necessary to read their brain. Someone else receiving a vision from a Hindu avatar while rocking rhythmically in place might not experience the same level of spiritual intensity if they're lying in a noisy fMRI machine. But there is still some data available. So let's look at glossolalia. That's the incoherent babbling that Christians call speaking in tongues. Researchers have also observed glossolalia among other populations, including Inuit tribes in the Arctic, the Sami people indigenous to Finland, and voodoo practitioners in Haiti. Because Christianity is what I most know, I'm going to stay in my lane here. So let's home in on the Pentecostal Christian phenomenon called speaking in tongues, which I was told was the language of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues was symptomatic of being slain by the Spirit. So what we learn here might be applicable to other such mystical experiences as well. So Dr. Newberg and his researchers studied the effects of glossolalia on several Pentecostal Christians. SPECT imaging showed that when they prayed in tongues, there was decreased activity in the frontal lobe. And this is directly opposite of what they found among meditating Buddhist monks. Now remember, the frontal lobe is our concentration area, and it's also partially responsible for language and voluntary movement, and it's where most of the brain's dopamine-sensitive neurons are found. Dopamine, a brain chemical related to feelings of reward and pleasure, plays an important role in mystical experiences, and we'll come back to more about dopamine later. For now, I'm going to show you a picture of what the Pentecostals' brains looked like when they sang in worship and prayed in tongues. You'll notice it's not as red as the Buddhist monks. So what this lack of redness means compared to the Buddhist monks is that there's less concentration and less control over verbal language and voluntary movement. So another researcher, a biological anthropologist named Christopher Lynn, thinks that glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, is best viewed as a dissociative state of consciousness. He's not alone in observing this data as indicative that people speaking in tongues are temporarily losing an awareness of their sense of self. 
This helps to explain the lack of self-consciousness that many people have when getting drunk on the spirit or undergoing another such mystical experience. Lastly, we have data from neuroradiologist Dr. Jeff Anderson. Dr. Anderson conducted a study among Mormons using an fMRI machine, a brain scanner. The participants were shown religious materials and asked whether they felt the spirit. Most of the participants said they did at some point, reporting feelings typical of an intense worship service, like peace and physical sensations of warmth. Many were even moved to tears by the end. So this is what one of the participants' brains looked like. You can see all those little areas of blue lit up. So some of the, one of those areas of blue, that was their nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens is the region of the brain where dopamine goes when we process feelings of reward. So you know what else lights up the nucleus accumbens is drugs sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> so now that we've established that these altered states are mystical experiences and neurologically validated the authenticity of their realness, at least for some, let's move to part two. How? How are people getting drunk in the spirit? And how are they getting their kundalini to rise and these other such mystical states? Is everyone faking it? Clearly not. Is it supernatural? I'm not inclined to think that either. So then what is causing people to have the very real symptoms that accompany mystical experiences? So this question led me to a radio interview featuring an ex-Pentecostal pastor named Mark Havel. Mark wanted to come clean about how he used to slay people in the spirit. He wanted to expose some of the ways that pastors and especially money incentivized faith healers got crowds to donate money in the tithe bucket in hopes that God would give them a miracle, maybe a vision or a healing or just a special sense of God's touch. That's usually the goal of a mystical experience and a cold hard truth about revival conferences and ashram retreats and other spiritual workshops is that money can be a motivator. Not for everyone, but for many so-called miracle workers and spiritual growth facilitators. So the radio host asked Mark Havel how it was that so many job-holding, tax-paying, average citizens let themselves be just knocked to the floor and allegedly healed of illnesses at these mass spiritual revivals, like the ones that I grew up going to, where I saw many so-called faith healings. And Mark's answer was simple hypnosis. <laughs> he said that the reason people were falling down was because they're suggestible. By getting a person into a suggestible state, which is an altered state of consciousness, they were effectively in a state of hypnosis. And guys, I could have fallen out of my chair when I heard him say this because it just made so much sense to me. So Mark explained that hypnosis is largely misunderstood. A person can be hypnotized and still fully aware and responsive to their environment. The best way to hypnotize a group at a spiritual revival, he said, was to first have a long period of praise and worship. And do you ever notice how a lot of times these things start off with worship? Ideally, the music would mirror the functions of the cardiovascular system when the rhythm pulses at the speed of a nice, relaxed heartbeat. Another integral part to hypnosis is the repetition of certain words and phrases by the worship leader or pastor. Biblical references to the Holy Spirit, fire, and revival work well. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not pastors are hypnotizing people deliberately. And let's give some benefit of the doubt, probably many of them are not, nor would they ever use the word hypnosis. Regardless, the effect is the same. Music and phraseology helps people to become hypnotized and therefore suggestible. I found clinical research to back this up. It was an HBO documentary called Question of Miracles that introduced me to the work of the late neurotheologist, Dr. Michael Persinger. Dr. Persinger explained that another aspect at play in hypnotizing a crowd of revival goers was what he called the group dynamic effect. 
So when thousands of people are gathered, he said, particularly in a large space where they're made to feel diminutive, their close proximity to one another produces a special kind of physiological arousal. And this physiological arousal is what gives people a sense of wholeness, a sense of unity, similar to being at a sports stadium or at a music festival. So question, would you throw your hands in the air if a random stranger on the street told you to? Probably not. <laughs> but under the right set of circumstances, like cheering on your favorite team at a game or standing among fans of the musician that you really admire, you are more suggestible to throwing up your hands in the air if you're told, especially if everyone else around you is doing it. This is the same as if you're an earnest believer in a spiritual setting. This is the influence of the group dynamic effect. Dr. Persinger said that the music often accompanying the group dynamic effect enhances this physiological arousal, which releases opiates in our brains. These opiates increase our hypnotizability. Once we're in this ecstatic, expectant trance state, the speaker, such as the pastor or worship leader or other spiritual teacher, can come out and orchestrate cognitive experiences. And as the speaker, the speaker begins to give the message, Dr. Persinger says, quote, they're full of imagery. These images take on tremendous personal value because of the elevation of the opiates. And then you see all the features of an opiate release. You get the smiles, a very mild glow, very much like a drunken state, end quote. Very much like getting drunk on the spirit. So what's something that opiates do? Opiates dull our pain. And the opiate release people have at spiritual revivals is the reason many believe themselves miraculously touched by God. Their pain goes away. I grew up watching hundreds of thousands of people get drunk on the spirit and claim to be healed of everything from arthritis to cancer. Some walked without pain for the first time in years or danced down the aisle just weeping with gratitude. How? Well, besides getting you into a suggestible state, hypnosis temporarily dulls your pain receptors. This is why some women use hypnosis techniques during childbirth. This is why when people are hypnotized at a revival, they can genuinely believe themselves divinely healed. They truly may not be experiencing any pain, whether their usual chronic pain or the pain that you normally have when you fall backward to the floor and writhe around. Now, another component to hypnosis and another component to mystical experiences is the placebo effect. Basically, our desire to have a mystical experience can sometimes be enough to bring one on, especially in combination with hypnosis and the group dynamic effect. So once again, the documentary A Question of Miracles introduced me to the clinical data verifying this. Dr. Neil Abbott is a researcher who conducted a study on volunteers suffering from chronic pain. He told them to lie in a room for half an hour while an energy worker worked on them from a nearby enclosed cubicle box. Those who believed in the power of healers reported clinically significant reduction in pain, and they also described balls of light and powerful physical sensations to the researchers. But there was a catch. In half of the cases, a healer was present performing a full ritual, and for the other half, the box was empty. And the results were the same, with or without a healer in the box. Dr. Persinger likens this experiment to the placebo effect of revival goers who are getting slain by the spirit, many of them also hoping for healings and spiritual breakthroughs. Now, I realize that these ex explanations of hypnosis and placebo effect may sound offensive to some of you, especially if you did undergo a genuine mystical experience. No one wants to think they were simply hypnotized and it worked because of their own wishful thinking. So I don't mean to downplay or trivialize the importance of your experience, but I am here to share what I've learned about mystical experiences in hopes that it might release you or others of a possible lingering fear of hell or God or other supernatural phenomena, as this was crucial to my own healing from religious trauma syndrome. 
In other words, I'm hoping to demystify mystical experiences. We can perhaps all be susceptible to placebo effect and hypnosis, especially under certain circumstances. Not all circumstances, but maybe particular ones where our own confirmation bias is at play, whether consciously or not, whether in a clinical drug trial or a spiritual setting. So I mentioned non-soberly induced mystical experiences, like taking psilocybin mushrooms, which you might know as magic mushrooms or maybe just shrooms. Perhaps nothing demonstrates the placebo effect in regard to mystical experiences than the following example. So in one recent study, 33 participants were put into a room for four hours with music, artwork, and colored lights. They were given a drug that they were told was psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. But they were secretly all given a placebo. The researchers had also placed several actors among the group who pretended that they were tripping in a further attempt to convince the participants that they were given the real thing. And you know what? It worked. The majority of participants, 61%, reported psychedelic effects ranging from feeling heavy, as if gravity had a stronger hold, to seeing paintings on the wall appear to move or reshape themselves. The researchers thought the results of this experiment not only validated the placebo effect of mystical experiences, but also explained so-called contact highs, where people experience the effects of a drug just by being around others who are actually doing it. So if the placebo effect can be this powerful among people being told that they were given an actual drug, how much more powerful might it be among people where everyone is sober and the promising touch of God or the divine is believed to be accessible to all? And we're told that it is accessible to us because God loves us and wants to touch us if only we're open and have enough faith. So this concludes the how portion of mystical experiences. In summary, the effects of hypnosis and placebo are enhanced in settings that foster herd mentality and groupthink. Churches definitely foster these qualities, as do temples, mosques, meditation groups, and martial arts dojos. This is what the whirling dervishes of Turkey have in common with martial arts monks. This is what Native American Sundance ceremonies have in common with Shaktipat initiations, in which a guru puts his hand on the forehead of a recipient and passes along a spiritual awakening, like what we saw in that video. Or, as in my churches, when a pastor touches your forehead and passes along the Holy Spirit. Deliberate or not, getting participants into a soberly induced trance state by means of chanting, dancing, singing, worship, or meditating makes them suggestible. And combined with the hope of an individual to experience a spiritual awakening or other breakthrough, this potent combination of expectation and dulled critical thinking ability leaves them vulnerable to the symptoms orchestrated by the group leader. Sometimes these symptoms come on spontaneously, and other times they're triggered by touch or a gesture or a word from the speaker. I think Dr. Michael Persinger may have said it best when he said that the charismatic leader of spiritual gatherings is simply the catalyst that starts a person's ability to heal themselves. Healing, he said, doesn't come from the healer. It comes from the person's own brain and their own expectations and their own changes in brain chemistry and brain electricity that produce changes in their own body. So now we've arrived at part three. Why? <laughs> and this is like my most burdensome and also favorite question. Why do we have the ability to heal ourselves this way? Why do we have the ability to be hypnotized or to enter trance states or speak in tongues or other forms of glossolalia? Why do we sometimes lose control and awareness of our bodies and to what purpose? Asking why humans can have mystical experiences that alter our consciousness might be like asking why we have consciousness at all. What is consciousness? We don't yet have a solid agreed upon definition. To some people, consciousness is synonymous with soul. To others, consciousness is the energy that plays upon the hardware of our brains. And yet others think that consciousness is the product of our brains, 
nothing from outside ourselves, but generated from within, a fascinating product of our physicality. When our brain dies, does our consciousness? Why do we dream? Why do we have deja vus and out of body or near death experiences? So I'm a person that can ask why all day long. And I did as a child, surely driving my parents crazy and my pastors. <laughs> but the more satisfying question that I now love to ask is how? And sometimes asking how can lead us to the why. Often it leads me to this open-ended bottom line. We don't know. Not yet. And if this frustrates you, I feel your pain. <laughs> I would just like to know everything. <laughs> But what is evident is that faith can have an undeniable effect on the human brain. And as we've seen, your brain during a mystical experience lights up the same areas as drugs and alcohol intoxication, gambling and sex with a new partner. Why? Maybe because like these other examples, mystical experiences just feel good. That's what they say anyway. I may never know. So who is capable of a mystical experience? And why isn't everyone? Some studies suggest that the expression of a certain gene called VMAT2 is responsible. VMAT2 is nicknamed the God gene. It affects our monoamine levels, which affect our levels of serotonin, norepinephrine, and here it is again, dopamine. Geneticist Dean Hamer hypothesizes that these all play an important role in regulating brain activity associated with mystic beliefs. Studies of twins show that there's a 40 to 50% genetic component to whether or not one believes in God, even among twins separated at birth. Yet another study verifies that genes may account for up to 50% of our religiosity and deductively our lack thereof. So studies like this are often flawed, right? Most rely on self-reporting, which is a bit immeasurable to say the least. And it may be oversimplifying to suggest that there is one gene responsible for your core beliefs. And people are understandably reluctant to reduce a cultural axiom as significant as religion down to the presence of a single variation in our genetic code. When we have little reason to suspect brain scan images are lying though, or the genotyping results of DNA, these self-reports become easier to identify and verify. But maybe not everyone is capable of a soberly induced mystical experience. I haven't been. Just as brain scans confirm certain activity in the brains of spiritual people, other studies verify the different neural wiring of those who are atheists. For instance, studies show that the faithless may have a larger hippocampus and less dopamine in their brains. Now remember, dopamine plays a huge role in mystical experiences. Some neuroscientists think that a variance in dopaminergic genes is responsible for a person's ability to speak in tongues. The results of another study suggest that highly hypnotizable people have a more effective frontolimbic attentional system, further suggesting the involvement of dopamine in hypnotizability. Maybe some people like myself don't have the genetic expression that would allow us to be hypnotized, therefore not allowing us to have soberly induced mystical experiences. And then there's this take. Some researchers suggest that atheism is the result of mutated genes. Atheism has been linked to other genetic abnormalities like ill health, autism, hyperintelligence, and even left-handedness. Now the data here is pretty loose, but it does make sense to me that atheism may be rare among humans because not going along with a spiritual program means not going along with a cultural program, which evolutionally means a risk of ostracism and therefore a lesser chance of survival. Maybe. If our genes wire us predominantly towards social survival, and this includes usually shared spiritual beliefs, it seems understandable that the incapacity for belief may be something of a mutation. And I'm not gonna lie, being called a mutant like an X-Men kind of tickles my fancy. Lastly, another theory as to why humans are capable of mystical experiences is that they can foster a sense of spirituality and shared spirituality can lead to greater cooperation among human groups 
and this may have given us an evolutionary advantage. People of spiritual and religious beliefs tend to live seven years longer than non-believers. They tend to have healthier lifestyles, which reduces risks associated with chronic disease. Believers tend to avoid cigarettes, alcohol, and drug abuse. They tend toward marriage and monogamy and have less risky sex lives. And they're oriented toward prayer or meditation, which studies have shown have a positive effect on stress, which leads to better sleep, less cardiac strain, and a host of other life-prolonging benefits. And perhaps most significantly, spiritual and religious people tend to be part of a community. So maybe it was our more spiritual ancestors primed toward belief because of certain genetic traits, whose faith gave them a greater will to survive and the social cooperation incentives necessary to get through cataclysmic environmental changes, which then perhaps resulted in their raising more spiritually prone offspring as people without a genetic propensity for faith may have died out. Theories of this sort of natural selection don't seem that far-fetched to me. From neuroscientists to anthropologists, numerous experts in the fields of human development agree that spiritual capacities could have likely been the result of a cognitive development necessary for survival. So in conclusion, understanding the science of mystical experiences is what gave me peace about never having any, not through sober means anyway. <laughs> The findings of neurotheology helped me heal from religious trauma syndrome by allowing me to see that I was never left out by God at all. The neurological cocktail that I'd grown up calling being slain by the spirit was likely nothing more than a combination of feel-good serotonin, thrilling dopamine, and blissful hits of oxytocin. And this is the mel that leaves people feeling lost in the infinite love of the divine. This is the opiate release that can keep them coming back for more one really can get high on Jesus, and one really can get drunk in the spirit. One really can become something of a spiritual addict as their brains crave the opiates that keep them coming back for more. Neurologically, revivals and spiritual experiences are not unlike a mass drug outpouring. And just like with psychedelics, there can be good trips and bad trips, but most are all gonna be considered healing journeys. And as far as the bizarre bodily symptoms, like the shaking and the rolling around on the floor and the sobbing and giggling uncontrollably, well, if you've ever tripped acid or mushrooms or seen people who have, and I'm not saying I have, uh, you'll notice similar behavior under those types of mystical experiences as well. Basically, mystical experiences, whether soberly induced, plant induced, or pharmaceutically induced, all share some odd looking traits. On the outside, it can kind of look like lunacy, but on the inside, genuine transformation can be taking place. And some people have no neurological trouble at all, melting right into the bliss of the nucleus accumbens. And others like myself, we just seem to have a harder time letting go of our frontal lobe activity, which is, again, is the part of our brains responsible for staying in, in control. Some people's dopamine systems make them more susceptible to being hypnotized and speaking in tongues, while others seem immune. And far from it being our fault, it may just simply be our genetic inheritance. Neurotheology helped me see that there was never a sin in my life that kept God at bay. It wasn't because I didn't have enough faith that God never touched me or you. If you never felt God either, I'm here to tell you. It wasn't your fault. While we still have much to learn about the neuroscience of what we call spirituality, everything that I've learned has assuaged me of any lingering supernatural fears. I don't think there is anything supernatural. I think that what we call the supernatural is just a lazy and arrogant way to avoid saying we don't know yet. And the yet is my favorite part. Science discovers paradigm-shattering worldviews all the time, and its discoveries are wondrous, but not, I think, paranormal, just utterly dazzling. And it is my hope that sharing this information with you helps to inspire you on your own healing journey from religious trauma. So thank you for coming to my presentation. 
Alice, that was just fascinating. Very well done. The amount of research that you put into this. Wow. <laughs> and and we do have um, quite a few questions. So I don't know what your schedule is like. I don't know if you would be able to stick around for a few minutes and see I'm about here. answering yeah. some of these. Okay. And I will yeah, just... Yeah. Remind um, our viewers and our question submitters that Alice is not a psychologist or a doctor. Uh, she is just a very smart person who's super curious and did a lot of research on this topic. So I need to go through and ask some of these questions. Um, one that I thought was quite interesting um, from Terry Daniel, who's actually another one of our speakers, will be coming up in a couple of days, a few days from now. And uh, Terry said, what about mystical experiences that don't happen in groups? So I don't know if that's anything that you've studied or not, but what's your thought on that? Yes. So I have come across a few of those. And um, I know people who are not even necessarily Christian anymore, but can still alone in their quiet time or meditative time, whatever, when they're just by themselves, can still pray in tongues and can still like uh, claim to receive like visions and kind of trip out by themselves and have like a solo mystical experience. Um, I do think that they're there's got to be a bunch of people who have these types of solo mystical experiences. For example, um, Hindu or, or Buddhist monks who meditate for years up in the Himalayan mountains and caves. Like, I think I think there are ways to soberly induce a mystical experience, accidentally or not, when you're alone. I think that the the point in most of the research that I found did tend to focus on the mystical experiences that happen at mass revivals. And I do think that all the evidence that I've come across does suggest that the group dynamic role, AKA peer pressure, mm -hmm. um, can, can really up the odds of that happening. Um, a fake it till you make it sort of thing. And a lot of people really are making it if they have like an open mind and open heart or, you know, faith as mm -hmm. we called it in, in church. So um, I don't think that at all means that you cannot have a soberly induced mystical experience by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for some it's spontaneous, maybe for some it's not. There's a lot of other research that I came across while researching this and my book that um, connected certain spontaneous mystical experiences to seizures. There's something that can go on in the temporal lobe of the brain mm -hmm. that does seem to correlate to mystical experiences. And again, not an expert neuroscientist and, and other people will be able to speak to that much more intelligently than I can. But I hope that answers your question, Terry, that, um, that yeah, I've definitely come across research of solo mystical experiences. And so you don't have to have the group dynamic effect at play in order to have one super interesting and um one would think also perhaps there might be times uh because of circumstance whatever's going on in our life we might actually be more susceptible to having such an experience if we've had a a loss or a scare or something's gone on and all kind of all of our systems are in overdrive or whatever it is um, mm. boy that would be so interesting to find out more um, research on that. Um, and let's oh, see. Endlessly fascinating. There's so much I couldn't include. I could go on about this for like a whole conference. <laughs> or maybe a whole book. Maybe another maybe book. Maybe a whole book. It might be my next book. We'll see. <laughs> um, let's see. I just began ketamine treatments to treat mm -hmm. my severe depression. And it has been life-changing. Well, I'm glad to hear that. The science behind why it works isn't clear yet. So far, the studies are indicating that people who have hallucinations during the treatment have a better chance of positive results. Does neurotheology have any ideas about why this might work? That is so interesting. That is interesting. Um, I'm sure neurotheology does have a bunch of answers and theories uh, uh, specific to ketamine. So there, ketamine has had a lot of research and is being medically approved in many states to treat things like depression and PTSD. Um, it's so ketamine is a, is a, a non soberly induced mystical experience. Um, 
and then it. <laughs> so it's it's a uh, it there there it, it is um, a very deep that noetic quality that William James talks about that it's it's a very subjective internal ineffable indescribable sort of experience. Um, it's uh, like all of these things, like all of these mystical experiences, they're going to be a little bit different to everyone. Some people have a more vision like hallucinatory experience. Some people have more of a bodily feeling. Um, they're going to be a little bit different to everyone, whether they're soberly induced or non-soberly induced, like with uh, plant medicines or pharmaceuticals like ketamine and LSD. So uh, yeah, I think that I, I would wager just from my own little research that ketamine just qualifies as another sort of mystical experiences. And as we've seen, genuine healing can come out of this. And I'm inclined to think all the more so when there actually is of a physical product being ingested somehow um, that that is quantifiably no faith required having an actual effect on the brain. Um, I don't, I'm not as well versed in exactly what parts of the brain ketamine is connecting, but other psychedelics are known to light up um, several different parts of the brain that normally don't communicate that much to each other. And that's what gives us um, an altered sense of reality and ability to be more vulnerable and empathetic and open and lower our defenses to look at our shit and like grow. And that's the therapeutic value of all of these types of mystical experiences is ultimately they can be really fun. Um, like I remember seeing people at the Toronto Blessing just giggling on the floor for hours. And I laughed too, because I thought it was hilarious seeing all these grownups like giggling around and it wasn't the spirit making me laugh. I just thought it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> and uh, cause it was like the, I remember these, this one group of people got stuck in an elevator and they were holding up the elevator. The door kept trying to shut and they were all in like this cuddle puddle on the floor of the elevator no. and their legs were blocking it so <laughs> sometimes mystical experiences whether from drugs or faith they're just fun and that alone can be healing how many how often do we get to have fun and play and be silly like that we don't very often give ourselves permission but for other people it can be terrifying i remember at one toronto blessing conference a guy i knew um he felt like God was taking away his breath. He couldn't breathe. And his vision that accompanied that sensation of not being able to physically breathe was God telling him, let go, trust me, I'm gonna keep you alive. So there's all sorts of ways that these can affect us. And ketamine, uh, I'm personally really excited to learn more about it from a clinical, less recreational standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but even recreationally, some people think they're they're tripping to have a, a fun time with their friends. And they end up having a total spiritual awakening, we might call it. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope that loosely answers that question enough. Right. And certainly um, the physiology, the brain chemistry of some folks um, would really be prohibitive from them uh, having any use with psychedelics at all. They really need to uh, avoid them, in fact. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, this one. So you decide if, if you feel comfortable answering this. Do you remember what your therapist did that helped you recover from having panic attacks and harming yourself as a future therapist planning to specialize in helping people recover from religion? I would love to know what worked for you. Oh, well, first of all, cheers for going into this field. It always makes me happy knowing that there's more therapists who are well-versed in, in religious trauma syndrome. So um, yeah, I don't mind sharing at all. I write about this actually quite a bit in my book, Wayward, which you can find in the exhibit hall uh, here at court. Um, long story short, the very first piece of advice that my therapist gave me was to let the panic attacks happen. And that went against every instinct that I had and anything that I thought I'd ever want to hear. It's like, that's the last thing I want to hear. Like, I don't want to let them happen. That's the whole point of why I'm seeing you is so that they don't happen. <laughs> um, but he told me that fighting them, when I felt a panic attack coming on, when I fought it, it might be driving me to hurt myself because you can't control a panic attack. And so you're fighting this thing that's happening to you. Um, and you're going nowhere, you're going to lose pretty much every time I personally don't know anyone who's had a panic attack and like, 
decided they weren't going to have one. So, um, (laughs) like, why would anyone have one then? Um, so he said to let them happen. And so, and he also said to notice where in my body the panic traveled. And so I was like, all right, well, let's give this dude a try. He ended up being my therapist for like about three years. So it worked, but yeah, the first time it happened that very night, I felt the panic coming on my, they always came on at night for me. And I managed to lay down on the floor and I observed that began in my stomach and sort of traveled its way up through my body and like lodged in my neck. And uh, I've said before that in retrospect, it kind of looks like being slain by the spirit a little bit because I was like lying on the floor, writhing and like shaking and crying as I was just observing where the panic was going. And uh, it, it lasted maybe a few minutes instead of a few hours, which for me was just like, life-changing. The other thing that my therapist recommended was that I start to see a psychiatrist who prescribed me clonopin um, to take as needed. I was pretty adamant at the time that like, I didn't want to be on medication regularly, but taking something as needed, I was open to. So similar to something like Xanax or Ativan, clonopin um, can help with anxiety. It's also helpful with seizures as it happens. Um, And I, so in conjunction with observing where my body and no longer fighting the panic and taking clonopin if I really felt like it was starting to get out of hand, gradually my panic attacks lessened and I got better at noticing when certain things seemed to trigger them. Now, some panic attacks just came from nowhere, like you might say a spontaneous mystical experience, but other times I could definitely trace like, oh no, this evangelist on Hollywood Boulevard fucking triggered me. Or like I go to a yoga class and everyone's like chanting "Om" and it feels so culty. And I was like, ah, oh, I, I couldn't do it. And so I learned to avoid certain situations that I came to recognize would trigger my anxiety and often sometimes lead to a panic attack. So, um, and then, yeah, like I said, therapy for, for a good three years following my panic attacks really, really helped. Wow. Thank you for for being so uh, earnest and sharing that with us. There are people here, I have no doubt, that (laughs) are going to be really helped by what you just shared. Thank you very much. Um, (laughs) I think we're going to um, draw to a close for this evening. Thank you so much.